stuff. So I'm just gonna give it a few seconds. But um, hope you guys are all doing well. Hope your A levels are going well. And uh, yeah, okay, Renee is connected. So good afternoon, Renee. Hope you're doing well. Uh, let's make a start. But before we do, for those of us that don't know me, I can see a lot of familiar names. But for those of us that don't know me, my name is Daniel. I'm a GCSE and A-level math tutor and I run classes every week. So what we're going to do today, because you guys have got your exams coming up, the first one is on the 6th of June. So what I've done is I've got a couple of uh, uh, pure questions, pure maths questions that we're going to go through. So uh, let me just share my screen with you guys. So before we go through it, though, uh, the way I normally run group classes, when I have a group of people in the classes, I actually let you guys uh, go through it first. But uh, because A-level maths, is, the questions are quite long and comprehensive, maybe what we'll do is I'll go through it. And then obviously, while I'm going through it, I'll ask you guys questions just to make sure that you guys understand and prompt you guys. Yeah. So, or we may do a combination. I may let you do it first. And then I would go through it and then or there would be other questions which I, just, which I just go through with myself. Yeah. And then you guys can let me know if it all makes sense. But yeah, we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, the first question that we're going to do is uh, this one. So we'll see how many we can get through in an hour. But we're going to do this one. Now, this is seven marks in total. So what I'm going to do, uh, it's not too bad if you know what you're doing. So I'm going to let you try this one first. I'll let you try part A first, see how you get on with it. And then in about maybe four, five past 12, we'll go through it together. So have a go at this one. Have a go at part A. And if you get to part B, you can do it. And then, yeah. So, yeah, get your pen and paper. Have a go at it. And then, yeah, see how you get on. In the meantime, I'm just going to let uh, some people in. There's more people joining, so I'm just going to let them all in. And, uh, okay. Just wait for the people to join. It's still a lot of people training. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to anybody that just joined a few moments ago. I was just uh, just doing a little intro. So we've got this question here. We're going to do a couple of uh, questions uh, throughout the hour. Um, we're doing this one. Have a go at it. See how you get on. And uh, yeah, let me just make sure everybody's all connected and everything. Everybody can all hear me, right? By the way, just let me know in the chat. I think you guys can anyway, but just let me know that you guys can all hear me. Just somebody just put yes or anything like that, just so I know. Cheers. Thank you very much, Rene. Alex. Cool. So, yeah, we're doing this one. So having a look at this one, what are what are our thoughts on it? So what do we think? Put a zero if you're looking at this question thinking, I don't know what to do. I'm very confused, very, very stuck. And put a 10 if this is a super easy question. I know exactly what to do. This is not a problem. I want you guys to all give me a number between zero and 10, just so I can gauge how you guys are getting on with it. If that's okay. 10, that's good, that's good. Any other numbers? Four, fair enough, fair enough. Okay. So for those of us, we'll go through it uh, in a, maybe about two minutes, but for those of us that are a bit stuck on how to do this one let me just see the chat again zero no 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 you guys will be fine but just think about it like this right we have a we have a function that asks us to find the range of the function right now remember the range of your function are the set of y values that it can take so whenever you're looking at a question think look at it in a vertical plane look up and down if i'm looking up and down on this graph in particular i can see that there is a maximum value right and then all the values after that are going below, right? So maybe what you could kind of do is think to yourself, okay, if I could find out what that maximum value is somehow, some way, that will give me the highest value of the function. And then everything below it will just uh, be the other values that it could take. Yeah? So the key to this question is thinking about how you can get that maximum value. Okay. We'll go through it very shortly. <laughs> Good afternoon to anybody uh, that's just joined in the last few moments. We're just going over a couple of uh, 
fast paper question. So this is the first one. Uh, I'm gonna go for it in about a minute or less than that. And then, yeah, let me just uh, get my charger as well. Okay. If anybody's got an answer as well for part A or part B, then just let me know. You can put it in the chat. And remember you guys, if you have an answer, you can just message me directly if you don't want anybody to see your answer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's been about five minutes now. So I'm going to go through it with you guys. Now, while I'm going through the question, I'll probably ask some questions to you guys. So if I ask a question, just drop a message in the chat, just so I know that you guys are, are following and understanding. Yeah? So let's just see. Okay. I've got an answer, which is good to see. Anyways, so it says, let's read it. It says the function f is defined by f of x is equal to 16x minus e to the 2x, right? The graph of y equals f of x is sketched below. And it says find the range of f. And it's five marks. So for me, Whenever I'm looking at a range question, as I said before, I'm looking vertically, right? Because we know, for example, if I just give you an example of a graph like this, let's just say I had a graph like this. Uh, let's say I had a graph like this, right? And I said, well, I've got a curve, right? And let's say it starts here. Let's just say, for example, this is eight. And then it goes like this, and then it stops here. And let's say this y coordinate here is two, yeah? Can we see that the range for this graph here will just be, let's say this is f of x, right? Let's say it's f of x. The range will just be between 2 and 8, wouldn't it? So it'll be like this, f of x and 8. Yeah? Because the set of y values go from 2 to 8. Now, this one is the same thing. If I look at this curve here, well, I can see that it has a turning point here, right? Now, if I call this value, let's, we don't know what it is, but let's call it y1, for example. The range of this function here would be the set of y values that start at y1 and go all the way down to negative infinity. Yeah? So for me, the answer to the question, the range of this question will just be equal to, range will just be equal to uh, f of x, right? Is less than or equal to that y1 there. Yeah. Now, obviously, this isn't our actual answer, but this is the structure of it. We just need to figure out what that value is. Does that make sense, guys, as a star? As to way to go about it, just gonna say, just wait for anybody to say yes or no, just just so I know that all is making sense. Is that clear? Yeah, good. All right, good. Okay. So the question is, how do we find that? Well, we know it's a maximum point, right? Can somebody tell me how do I find maximum points with functions? Give a couple of seconds in case anybody wants to answer. Thank you very much, Renee. Thank you very much, Alex. We have to find the derivative, right? So we've got f of x here. Right? This is equal to, uh, what is it? 16x minus e to the 2x. 16x minus e to the 2x, right? And remember, we're finding the derivative, but it's not just finding the, finding the derivative. What else do we need to find a maximum, minimum turning point? We find the derivative and set it equal to? Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much, Rene, Alex, Lucy, Hannah. We say equal to zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the derivative, set equal to zero. That value of x will give us the x value of that point there. Yeah, all right. So doing this one here, we need to differentiate. So we've got f dash of x. f dash of x. This is equal to, well, if I differentiate 16x, this will just go to 16. And then now I need to differentiate e to the 2x. Now remember how we differentiate e to the function of x, we differentiate the function, 2x is, goes to 2, so we put 2 at the front, and then we keep it the same, like this. Yeah. So therefore, f dash of x is equal to 16 minus 2e to the 2x, and because we're looking for that point y1, we need to set equal to 0, yeah? So now, solving this, we're going to say, well, 16 is equal to uh, 2e to the 2x. We're going to divide by 2 to give us 8 e to the 2x. Now, to get x on its own, we need to take that ln of both sides. So we're going to get ln 8 is equal to 2x. And then now to half it, we're going to get x is equal to a half ln 8. Yeah? Now, remember, remember, this is not our answer. This is the value of x where that turning point occurs, right? So what I need to do now is plug in 
that value of x that I found into my original function to give me y1. Yeah. So I'm going to do this now. Yeah. So remember the function here, I'll do it here. The function is this. We know that the minimum or the maximum, sorry, occurs at x equals a half ln eight. We're just going to plug that in. Yeah. So we're going to get a f of a half ln eight is equal to 16 lots of a half ln eight minus e to the two and then a half ln eight. Yeah. So now plugging this in and uh, simplifying, we've got 16 and a half. That's just goes to uh, eight. That's going to be eight ln eight, right? And then we've got this here. Now this two and this half will cancel out. So I'll just do it here very quickly, right? This will become e to the ln of eight. And this here, e to the ln's cancel is just eight. So it's just eight ln eight minus eight. That value of y1 there, this value of y1 here is eight ln eight minus eight, right? So therefore the range of this question, the range of this function would now be just to uh, put it all together. The range would be f of x would be less than or equal to 8 ln 8 minus 8. And that's our answer for part A. Anybody get this correct? I'm going to zoom out so you can see all of the work in. Anybody get this? I'm just looking at the chat to see if I've got any answers. Da, 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 da. Okay, I can see somebody put in the chat x is less than or equal to ln 8 over 2, which was what our x value, right? So just to be very careful, right? Remember, this is not your answer. Your answer to the what is the y value. You get that by plugging it back in. So just keep that in mind for those put there. Did you get eight ln eight? Is it because the e and the ln cancel out? Okay. Did you get eight ln eight minus eight because e and ln? Yeah, yeah, I did. So let me just explain that as well. So here, I got eight ln eight minus the eight because right here, right here, this two and this half, right, cancel, and it leaves with e to the ln eight. Now remember. E to the ln of x, this is just a formula, is equal to x. These cancel out. So I'm just left with A. Does that make sense? And I forgot to put it back in. Yeah, guys, just remember that. Remember that when you're looking for a maximum or minimum point, you differentiate, make it equal to zero. The value of x that that gets you is not your maximum or minimum. You plug it back in. Yeah, that's very important. Let me just check. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so we've done that. Now, how about part B? How about part B? So we've got this one here, the composite function fg is defined by fg of x is equal to 16 over x minus e to the 2 over x. Anybody can answer this? How would you find the domain of this function? Okay, well, this one here, I've just got an answer, a question in the chat. How would you find the domain of this function here? Uh, for this function in particular, right, the domain is all real values of x. Because if you think about it, and they can ask you that sometimes, but if you look at this function here, right, what I like to do is I like to break this down. I've got this here. This function is comprised of this term here, and it's comprised of this term here. Yeah. Now this is just a linear term. There are no uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There are no uh, bogey spots with linear functions. They are defined for all values of x. Right. This one here is the same. It's just e to the two x, which looks something like this. All values of x are defined here. So this whole thing here. Is going to be for all real values of x. So this, so this, so this particular question is just all real values of x. Yeah, there's no bogey spots here. This isn't the type of question that they'll give you in an exam. Yeah, because this question, this function is continuous everywhere. Yeah, there are no asymptotes or anything. For those that were asking uh, about how we would find the domain of that one, is that clear? Just make sure we're all clear with that. Yeah, cool. No problem. No problem. All right. So uh, part B. Did anybody do? Did anybody do part B? So it says the composite function fg is defined by f of, f of g of x is equal to 16 over x minus e to the 2 over x. And we need to find an expression for g, g of x. Now, looking at that one, let's just remind us of what the actual function is. It's f of x equals 16x minus e to the 2x. Yeah. f of x equals 16x minus e to the 2x. Now, just looking at this one before I go for it, what are, what are our thoughts on it? Put a zero if you don't know what to do, very confused, and put a 10 if this is super easy. And if you have an answer, put it in the chat. Yeah, so I just want everybody to give me a number between zero and 10, just so I get an idea as to how you guys find this one in particular. Okay, cool, I can see seven, I can see eight, it's good, good. All right, so doing this one. Now, for me, the way I look at it is that this is my original function here, and apparently 
they've said that f of g of x, right, which we mean, which we know means that g goes into f, right? This is apparently equal to 16 over x minus e to the 2 over x, you know? So for me, this is obviously very similar to the original function. Now, how is it similar? When I'm doing a function, I always remind myself that, well, this is our input here. Whatever goes here, right, must go here and must go here, right? Everything in blue is the same. Now, if this here is our, uh, our composite function and we have 16 over x minus e to the 2 over x, right? The only thing that's changed is that the x has now become divided by x. So for me, looking at this question, right, the way I would look at it is I say, well, I've got this here. How can I get that? How can I get the 16 over x? Well, I'll just put 1 over x, right? Because I have 16 over x that will replace it here, and then this will give me the 2 over x. Does that make sense? So to make sure all okay with that just before I continue. Is that clear? So that way, for sure, for sure, our g of x is equal to 1 over x, right? So if g of x is 1 over x and we want g, g of x, well, we'll just put in g back into itself. So it'll be 1 over 1 over x, which is just the reciprocal of that. So this is just x. So our answer is just x. Does that make sense, guys? Anybody have any questions on that? Just before we go into another question? Make sure we're all okay. Okay, okay. I'm not seeing any messages, so I'm assuming this is all clear. Let's check. Good stuff. All right, cool. Now let's go to another one. Let's see which ones we have here. Let's uh, let's do let's do this one here. Let me just see the chat. So g of x is the so g of x is the x function. Yeah. So so uh yeah. So g, g of x is equal to x but so for the person that's asking about the answer, yeah? Let me just double check. Let me just show you. So g, g of x, right, is equal to x. Remember, the original function for g is 1 over x. It's the reciprocal function. So when I plug it back into myself, 1 over 1 of x is equal to x, yeah? All right. Now, let's do this one. Where did I put it? I don't think I did it yet. All right. So we've got this one here. All right. Now, this one is seven marks, so we're going to do it together. But just I'm going to give you a chance to just have a look at it and uh, let me know what your thoughts are. So this is obviously integration by substitution. Now, if something like this comes up on uh, on Tuesday, how, how are we feeling? How do we feel about this type of question in particular? Put a zero if you're looking at this thinking, I have no clue where to start. And put a 10 if you think this is very, very easy, very, very straightforward. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think I've got some, one of my students, we've done this together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to be fair, I need to thank you guys because I found a couple of questions to do today from the quest lessons I do with you. But yeah, I can see, I can see 10, sixes, fives, fours. Okay, eights. All right, let's go through this together anyway. So remember with uh, integration by substitution, the whole point of it is that you have some nasty type of integral that you're not able to integrate right now. You use a change of variables to transform your integral into something that is more familiar to you, something that you can integrate, yeah? So let's have a start. So they've told us that x is equal to two sine theta. x is equal to two sine theta, right? Now, the way I always do these questions is I always uh, just look at the expression there. I've got x squared, yeah? I would square both sides of this to give me x squared is equal to, this will give me four, if I square the two, this will give me sine squared, yeah? So now I'm gonna update it, yeah? I'm gonna update this, so I'm gonna go integral of root three to zero, oh, let me do that again. Root three to zero is gonna be one over four minus x squared, but x squared is four sine squared theta, isn't it, yeah? Now remember, this is all to the power of what is that? That is a three over two. Yeah, cool. That is a three over two. Now I've got dx. Now remember what you're doing when you're doing integration by substitution. You're check. You're changing every single thing in terms of x into theta or to u, whatever variable they choose. Yeah. So we we've done a bit of it. What's missing? Well, we've got the dx that we need to get rid of. Yeah. Can somebody tell me, please? What do I do to get the dx? What do you always do when you're dealing with integration by substitution? What haven't I done yet that we, that we need to do?
exactly exactly thank you very much alex thank you very much uh vin Rene. yeah exactly we need to differentiate for sure yeah because how do we get dx well it's going to be remember x is equal to two something all right again well dx by d theta remember we're differentiating x with respect to theta so it's dx by d theta and then this is equal to can somebody tell me what do i get when i differentiate two sine theta What's the derivative of two sine theta? Thank you very much, Rene. It's two cos theta, yeah? So now we've got dx d theta is equal to two cos theta. Remember, we need dx, so we're just going to multiply both sides by d theta to get dx on its own. So therefore, dx is equal to two cos theta, right? d theta. Now, I'm going to plug this in here. So remember, you just update it as you go along, yeah? So I've got four minus four sine squared theta all to the power of three over two dx but remember dx is now two cos theta d theta yeah and remember it's in between root three and zero yeah now when i'm doing these types of questions right remember the two cos theta is just an expression i can an algebraic expression i'm going to put the two cos theta on the numerator so it looks like this i'm going to rub this out i'm going to put two cos theta here all right and then now I'm going to put the theta here. Yeah. So can you see we've successfully transformed our integral, which was in terms of x, all now in terms of theta. Now, before we continue, I've got a question for you guys. Am I am I happy? Am I home and dry? Can I continue? Or is there something I, I haven't done? It's all in terms of theta. So is it is it all good? Or is there an issue? Right, right, right. Thank you very much, Rene, Vin, Alex, uh, Lucy. Yeah, we need to change the limits of integration. Remember, this is a definite integral, right? Originally, this definite integral was defined between x values, isn't it? Remember, these limits here mean x is equal to root 3 and x is equal to 0. If I have a graph, what this means is that I'm integrating this function between 0 and root 3, yeah? Integrating it between 0 here and root 3, right? Now, we are not in the x world anymore. We're in the theta world. So we need to transform our x values into theta values. Yeah. So remember, we've got the substitution. So I'm going to write it here again. We've got x is equal to 2 sine theta. Right. And then now, uh, what are we going to do? We know that x is equal to 0 for the lower limit. So if x is equal to 0, I'm solving 2 sine theta is equal to 0. Well, I know that the sine of zero is zero. So this is just zero. Theta is equal to zero. You can check on your calculator. And then now we've got the other limit of integration is root three. Now, if X is equal to two sine theta, that just means two sine theta is equal to root three. And I'm going to get, well, sine theta is equal to root three divided by two. I'm going to just do the sine inverse on my calculator. And uh, this will be in uh, radians. Yeah, because it's, uh trig so let's uh let's just get my let me get my calculator just give me a sec one second where's my calculator okay you guys should see my calculator in a second okay so take the sine inverse of uh root three divided by two root three divided by two this gives us a uh, pi over three or third pi yeah theta is equal to pi over three so now for sure we finished because now I'm going to rub this out. Zero was zero anyway. This is going to be pi over three. Yeah. Okay. So now we're here. We've changed our limits of integration. We've got everything in terms of theta, right? And uh, now we're going to uh, integrate. Yeah. So let me just continue. So what have we got here? So da -da 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 -da. Oh, I've got a question in the chat. Let me just see. It says, how do you know if it's radians or degrees? That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, I remember I did this question before with all my students. I think with these ones, you can just kind of uh, gauge. Like, for example, if I was to put this in degrees, uh, I think the values wouldn't be, they wouldn't that flow. I think, I think I'll, I'll double check that, but it's definitely in radians, but I just, I will double check that. Because of root three is all the one because the, 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 yeah 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 true true but remember yes yeah, so i've just got an answer in the chat 
Yeah, yeah. So I'll double check that. I'll double check that. Yeah. Cool, cool. So yeah, let's continue. Let's continue. So we've got this here. Now we need to uh we need to tidy this up somehow. Yeah, this is trigonometry. So what do we do here? Well, if I look at this here, I've got something on the denominator. Now remember, when you're dealing with trig, right? I can see I've got four minus four sine squared theta, right? Now this is looking a bit familiar to me. Yeah, I'm gonna write this here. I've got four minus four sine squared theta, right? Now, if I take out a four, this will give me one minus cos one minus sine squared theta, isn't it? Yeah. And we know that that's cos squared theta. So therefore, the denominator, or inside the bracket anyway, is going to be four cos squared theta. Yeah. Now remember, it's all to the power of three over two. So if I apply that three over two here, four cos squared four cos squared theta. All to the power of three divided by two. Now, what will happen there? Remember, you're just going to times the powers together. So therefore, it will just be well. Let's let's do it. Let's be careful actually because we've got a four there as well. Yeah. So we've got a three over two. Yeah. Now, what we can do here as well say this is the same as four to the power of three over two multiplied by cos squared all to the power of three over two. Yeah. So now tidying this up, well, four to the power of three over two, square root of two, four is two, cubic, you get eight, this is an eight half. And then we times these two together, two times three over two is three. So it's just eight cos cubed theta, yeah? So therefore the denominator, the denominator here, right? is just gonna be eight cos cubed theta. We did it there, d theta. And then uh, we got two cos theta on the top. And this is still between pi over three, and zero, yeah? Now, tidying this one up, clearly this is just gonna be, well, the two and the eight make a quarter, right? And then I've got, or let me just do it like this here. Huh? I've got cos cancels once, this would be cos squared here, yeah? So I've got this here, I've got this here, and this is between pi over three and zero d theta, yeah? Does that make sense, guys? So let me make sure we're all okay with this just before we continue. Yeah, yeah. So just before I continue, couldn't you have done sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals one to rearrange? Yeah, absolutely. You could have done that. You could have done it. This is just another way of doing it. You could have done sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to one and then rearrange this identity together. It's the same thing. Yeah, same thing. It's just another way of doing it. But whatever works for you. Yeah, cool. All right. Now, We've got this here. We've got this here. Now we need to integrate this. Hold on, let me try this a bit now. We've got one over four cos squared theta, right? Now looking at this, anybody know what to do from here? Anybody have any suggestions as to how I integrate something like this? Think of your identities. So cos theta, okay. So remember, right, 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 exactly, exactly. So, so I've got a couple of different answers here. I can see double angle formula that some people are saying. I can see uh, tan. I can see sex squared. Remember, remember from your, remember from your identities, right? We know that this is a reciprocal function. We know that one over cos squared, right, is equal to sex squared. Yeah. Now, this is not the only way you can rewrite this, but why is it important to rewrite it like this? Because if you think about it, I've got one quarter, that one quarter's here. And if I write this as sex squared here, d theta, this is a standard integral that we should know. Can somebody tell me the integral of sex squared? Exactly, 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 exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah? The integral of sex squared is tan. Right? We know this. When we differentiate tan, we get sex squared. So the integral of sex squared is just tan. So that is why you should, whenever, you, whenever you're doing these identity type of questions, always think of your identities. Think to yourself, okay, what do I know? What, what uh, derivatives do I know? What integrals do I know? Sex squared is a standard integral. It's tan. So that way, this just becomes one quarter tan theta. And this is between pi over three and zero. Yeah. Now doing this, this is just easy. Now we just uh, plug in and evaluate. So we've got one quarter tan 
over pi over three for the upper limit minus one quarter tan of zero, yeah? Now, I know that the tan of zero is zero for sure because it looks like this. Yeah, that's definitely zero. So I'm going to cross that out. So the answer is just this, a quarter times tan pi over three. If I put it into my calculator, I get this here. One quarter times tan pi over three, tan pi over three, and uh, pi over three. This is uh, equal to root three over four. So each set is root three divided by four. Does that make sense, guys? I'm going to zoom out so you can see all of the work in. Is that clear? Anybody have any questions on that whatsoever? I'm going to make sure we're all okay with that. Yeah? And to be fair, to be fair, just realize it actually doesn't matter uh, what limit, what, um, what angle measurement you use, because if you put it in degrees, right, then the values, it will give it to you, it will just give it to you in degrees. But remember, because we're evaluating it, you'll still get these exact values out anyway, right? Because what is pi? Pi is uh, pi is 180 degrees. If I divide it by three, that's 60. So I'll just be getting tan 60 here, which is still the same as root three. So it doesn't matter. Yeah? Cool, cool. So yeah, we've done that. Let's see. Let's see what else we have here. What's another question that we can do that I think is good to do? Let's do, uh, let's do this one here. Now, this one is quite long, so we're going to do it in parts, yeah? We're going to do it in parts. Now, this one, uh, let me see. Whenever you do these questions, like, do you look at the X function and see if that is squared and then cube it and you do that? So I've just got a question. Let me just double, let me just go over that quickly again. So whenever you look at these, yeah, yeah. So with integration by substitution, right, whenever, whenever I'm doing them, I always look to see what's happening there. So because we had an X squared here, and they told us x is two side theta. It just made sense to square x and then just figure things out. When you, I'm sure you guys have done a lot of them by now. When you see the, all of the different types of combinations that you have for uh, integration by, by substitution questions, you'll see x cubes, x squared, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but it's just algebra at the end of the day. You'll get there in the end. I hope that I hope that makes sense. But yeah, let's do this one. We're going to do this in parts, right? Now, now I think I'm going to let you try this one <laughs> yeah this one i wanted to do this one because i saw this a couple a while back and thought it'd be good to do yeah so i'm gonna let you guys try this on your own part a i'll give you about four slash five minutes have a read of it see how you get on and then we'll go for it together yeah having a look at it though what do we think about a question like this put a zero in the chat if you're thinking i have no clue what to do hate these questions don't like them whatsoever and put a 10 if this is super easy 100 percent, this question comes up i'm getting full marks what do we feel about these types of questions here i want you guys to all put a number please in the chat between zero and ten oops and praise for this don't worry it will come up we know this this question always comes up every year yeah in different variations yeah. So yeah, just have a read of it, see how you get on, and we'll go through it very, very shortly. Yeah. If anybody's completely stuck whatsoever, just drop a message in the chat. Mm. For those of us that are stuck, right? Now, let's read it together. Let's see. Yeah. It says the volume of a cone of radius r and height h is a third pi r squared h, right? So that's what I would write here. I would write, well, v, right, is equal to a third pi r squared h. Yeah. Now, it says figure four shows a container in the shape of an inverted right circular cone, which contains some water. The cone has an internal radius of 2.5 meters and a vertical height of four meters, okay? The, at time t seconds, the, ta the height of the water is h, yeah? The volume of the water is v meters cubed and water is modeled as leaking from a hole in the bottom of the container at a rate of pi over 512 root h meters cubed per second. Show that while water is leaking, while the water is leaking, 
h that's h to the power of three over two dh by dt is equal to minus one over 200 all right so i'll give you a couple of minutes for everybody that's still working but for those of us that are a bit stuck right now when i'm looking at this question it's a show that question right so it just it just requires a bit of algebra now they're asking for h to the three over two dh by dt when i'm looking at these questions regardless what's the second part for anybody that's uh doing it let me put this here okay this is part b anyways yeah so looking at this question here yeah dh by dt for me that's telling me that i need to figure out what this is even though it's h to the power of three over two the way i'm looking at this question is well saying well if i need if i could figure out what dh by dt is and then multiply it by h to three over two after then i should get minus one over 200 so the key to this question is just figuring out what dh by dt is yeah now remember what you're doing these types of questions it's the chain rule remember what you learned in the beginning of year 13 right if i have dy dx and i have a variable u that connects them both dy over du times by du over dx right is equal to dy dx and why because these du's cancel out yeah so what you want to do is say to yourself okay well i've got dh by dt i know that will be dh by something multiplied by that same something divided by dt yeah now it's your job to figure out what that something is yeah now looking at this question guys does anybody have an idea of what that question mark may be think of the variables that you have in this question think about what they've told you it's a it's a cone right let's see it's right 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 so i've got two answers i've got dv and the radius right so remember when we're doing these types of questions right you're looking for functions you're looking for equations right now there is no explicit function for the radius right the radius is, is inside v so for sure i remember they've told us certain things about the volume leaking and so on and so forth it's definitely going to be dv yeah does that make sense for anybody that maybe thought a bit different? It's definitely going to be dv. Yeah? Does that make sense? I want to make sure we're all okay with that just before we continue. It's definitely going to be dv. Yeah? Just due to the fact that we've got the volume here, volume in capital V, we can somehow differentiate this to get an expression and blah, blah, blah. Yeah? Okay, good stuff. All right. Now, continuing. Well, let's read the question. All right. It says at time t seconds, the height of the water is h meters. The volume of the water v is the volume of the water v and water is modeled as leaking from the hole in the bottom of the container at a rate of this hair. So what is what is this? This hair is rate. Rate. What does that word mean when we're dealing with a level mass? Where, where do we see rate come up? It's the rate of change. It's dy by dx. It's dv by dt, dv by dr, blah, blah, blah. Whenever you see that word rate anywhere in A level maths, you're differentiating. Yeah. So now what is happening? Water is modeled as leaking, right? So for sure, water is volume. So for sure, it would be dv, right? And then it says, remember, always use the always use the uh, the units of measurement to help you out as well. Meters cubed. This is volume, right? It's per second. That's time. So for sure, it's going to be dv by dt, right? Is equal to pi over five hundred and twelve root h. Does that make sense, guys? Does that make sense? Why it's dv by dt? And I've got a question for you guys as well. Is this okay? This dv by dt, is this fine? Yes or no? What do we think? Is this okay? dv by dt is equal to pi over 12 root h. Are we okay with that? Yes or no? Okay. Be very careful. Be very careful with these questions. It's not correct. There's something missing. It says that it's modeled as leaking. Leaking. So the volume is decreasing, right? If the rate of change of the volume is decreasing, what does that tell you about the sign of the gradient? It's negative. So I have to put a negative sign here. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. So hope that all makes sense. I put a root h. Cool. So let's continue now. Anyways, we know that this is dv by dt. Remember, we need dh by dt. 
right? So I'm going to say dh by dt is equal to uh, dh by dv, right? Multiplied by minus pi over 512 root h, yeah? Now, the key now is to figure out what dh by dv is, yeah? Now, this is where it gets a bit tricky. Now, this question comes up not that much, this type of question, but if it does come up, what you've got to do is you've got to use uh, similarity, right? Because what we have here, we need to find out what dh by dv is. So for me, that means I need a formula that connects v and h together. Now, looking at what I have here, originally, the volume is equal to a third pi r squared h, yeah? Now, the issue right now is that I have it in terms of r and h. So what I need to do is figure out some sort of expression for r in terms of h. Plug it back into this to get it all in terms of h, and then I can differentiate, yeah? So how do we do that, though? Now, this type of question, all you've got to do is this. I'm going to get this diagram up again, right? Get this diagram up again. Got this here. So now I'm going to draw two cones, yeah? Now, remember, there's the actual cylinder, right? And there's this cone that is made by the water leaking, yeah? So I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw this. Uh, let me draw it into shape. This here. I'm going to draw a cone like this. Like that. To be fair, it's not really necessary. I'm going to do this like this here. Like this. And then like this here. Yeah. And then now I'm going to draw the same one. So remember, this is the water leaking. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to draw a bigger one here. Yeah. Now, remember, we know from GCSE, from all of these types of questions, right, these two cones are always similar, yeah? They're similar. So what I have here is that, well, for example, for the larger one, I have a height, right? I have a height of four meters, yeah? I also have a radius of 2.5, yeah? This is 2.5, yeah? And then for the smaller one, I have a height of H, right? This is the height of the water at any time. And then the radius is just going to be R, isn't it? We don't know it. Yeah. Now, because these are similar shapes, right? These are similar objects. What I can do is I can find expressions for the scale factors of the heights and the radius and equate them. Yeah. So, for example, the scale factors of the vertical heights, right, would just be the scale factor, would just be obviously the larger one, four divided by H. And then the scale factor for the uh, for the radius, for the radii, I should say, would be uh, 2.5, right, divided by R. Now, because these are similar, the scale factors have to be the same. So therefore, that means that I can just say, well, 4 over H is equal to 2.5 over R, yeah? Now I have an equation in terms of R and H. I can rearrange to make R the subject, and then that will give me R in terms of H. Now, does this make sense, guys? Just want to make sure we're all okay with this. Does anybody have any questions? Is this clear? You can wait for anybody just, anybody just to say yes or no, just before I continue. Yes. How would you know how to do this? So with what you want to do with these types of questions, right? Sometimes it doesn't come to you, but as, as long as you, for the exam, as long as you've seen every sort of type of question, then you should be fine, right? So you've seen it today, but if I'm in an exam and uh, I haven't seen a question like this before, well, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, what do I know about these types of shapes, right? They're similar. Yeah. So what you need to know as well with your exams and stuff is that you, need, you just need to re remind yourself of facts that you know from GCSE. And the fingers with these types of questions are quite long winded. And sometimes it may be may be a bit difficult. But just as long as you remember, OK, sometimes they can just put something out of nowhere. Yeah. So hope that makes sense. Let me just see the chat as well. OK, so uh, with this one here, let's continue. Right. Uh, We've got this here, 4 over h is equal to 2.5 over r. So now we're going to make r the subject. So if I times both sides by r, I'm going to get r here. And then this will equal, I'm going to divide by 4, right, and times by h. So it will be 2.5 h over 4, yeah? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this into my calculator. I'm going to put this into my calculator. I'm just going to put the constant part. So 2.5 over 4, just to see what it gives me. This gives me 5 over 8h, yeah? Five apes h, yeah? So now I've got R in terms of h. Now I'm going to plug that back into my volume question, my volume formula, 
right? So I'm going to say, well, V is now equal to one third pi R, remember, R was equal to 5 eighths H, yeah? 5 eighths H. And then it's, uh, what is it? H. So that's a squared here. That's H, yeah? So now I've got V in terms of H. This is good. Why? Because now I can just tidy up. And I can differentiate to get dv by dh and then flip it over to get dh by dv, yeah? So let's do that. Tidying this up now, we're going to get v is equal to, now I've got a third pi here. If I square this, this will give me 5 squared is 25, 8 squared is 64, right? I've got h squared here, and I'm times them by h, yeah? So tidying this up now, what I will do is I'll put uh, the constant part into my calculator and see what it gives me, yeah? So I'll put the constant part into my calculator. What does it give me? Well, I've got this here. I've got a third. Whoops. I've got a third pi. I've got a third pi like that. And then I've got times by 25 over 64. And what does this give me? Okay, this doesn't give me an exact value, right? So what I would do is I'll just get the fraction part dip bit by bit. Yeah. So I'll just delete the pi, give me the constant part, 25 over 192, and then it will be pi, isn't it? Yeah. So 25 over 192 pi yeah and then h cubed yeah all right now remember what the whole point of this question was we need to figure out what the h by dt is the key here we need to figure out what the h by dv is and we're nearly done because now we've got v in terms of h successfully we can just differentiate with respect to h can't we we've got dv by dh right and this is equal to now how do we differentiate remember this hair this entire thing here is a constant right so this is just normal differentiation we're going to move the three to the front Three times all of that, 192 pi, and then it will be h, cubed, h squared. Yeah. Yeah. So doing this here, let me just tidy up now. Got this here. We're going to do three times 25 over 192, and then times that 25 over 64 pi. Yeah. So dv by dh, right, is equal to 25 over 64. Let me just double check that. And then, uh, yeah, pi h squared. Yeah. Cool. So that's dv by dh. Remember, we need dh by dv. And as we can see here, which someone's pointed out in the chat, the pi's are going to cancel, right? Which is good. So if I flip this over here, right? What I'll do is I'll write this all as one fraction, just so it's clear. This is 25 pi h squared divided by 64, isn't it? If I flip this over to get dh by dv, right? It's just going to be 64 over 25 pi squared yeah so now i'm going to put this in into this formula here and then we're nearly done yeah let me just put this here copy this here and then now put it in dh by dv yeah it will be dh by dt is equal to 64 over 25 pi h squared times by minus pi over 512 root h yeah now, tidying this up, we can see clearly the pies will cancel out, right? And then what I would do here is I've got 64, I've got 25 here, I've got 512 here. I'm going to put this in my calculator and see what it gives me, yeah? Just to tidy it up. So let me get my calculator. This will give me uh, 64 over 25. And I'll times that by 512 with an I, just to get that constant part, yeah? This gives me 1 over 200. And that's perfect because this is 1 over 200, right? We have a negative symbol, negative sign. This is root h, yeah? This is dh by dt, yeah? So now, oops, sorry, I forgot the h squared as well, by the way. Forgot that. So 200 here and then h squared, yeah? Now, we're nearly done. If I tidy this up now, here, we've got just, we're just doing index laws here. We've got h root h and h squared. That there is just uh, h to the power of one half divided by h squared. So that's just one half minus two, which is just uh, minus three over two, isn't it? h to the minus three over two, yeah? So therefore we've got dh by dt is equal to minus one over 200, h to the minus three over two, yeah? Now, looking at the actual question, it says show that dh dt so that h of h to the three over two dh is equal to that. So we're done, right? Because we're here and we need to get this. Yeah. All we're going to do now is just divide by that there. 
If I divide by h to the power of negative three over two, right? Then that will flip to a positive, isn't it? When I uh, flip it over. So it's just gonna be, uh, it's gonna be this here, dh by dt is equal to minus one over 200. And then that is just h to the three over two, dh dt is equal to minus one over 200. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah so many colors may be hungry for an ice cream someone said <laughs> but yeah is this is this okay though is this make sense how do we feel about this type of question the part a like this do we feel like we'd be able to get this on tuesday if it comes up what do we think yeah all good okay so just remember if you ever see this type of question again the cone ones in particular it's a similar yeah you're just going to equate the scale factors to get uh, R in terms of H. Yeah, it's so many steps. I know, I know, I know. It's, very, it's a lot of steps. It's a lot of steps. But as long as you just practice, 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 should be fine. Now, let's go into part B and C of this one, yeah? All right. So we've got that. Part A is done. It says, given that the, the container was initially full of water, find an equation in terms of H and T to model this situation. So what have we done so far? Well, we've, let me just, I'm going to put this here. Now, this here is, what topic is this, guys? This particular part B. They ask us to find an equation in terms of H and T, and we've got the H by the T. So what do we need to do? Right, right. Integration. We need to integrate, but more, more uh, specifically, what topic exactly? Thank you very much, Lucy. It's a differential equation, yeah? Now, remember, let me just put this here on the bottom. Here. We'll put this on the bottom, yeah? Now, remember, we know how differential equations work. They give us some sort of uh, expression with uh, a gradient or derivative. You separate the variables, you integrate, and blah, blah, blah. Now, remember, what they always ask you for is they ask you for a particular solution. Now, remember what that means. You integrate separate variables, you get, a, you get a general solution, and they give you a set of initial conditions, yeah? Now, remember, they actually haven't given us any initial conditions explicitly, yeah? Now, that doesn't mean that there are no initial conditions, though. It says, given that the container was initially full of water. Now, we know that word initially, initial, that comes up all the time. What does that mean, initial? What do we think? When we see initial come up in an A-level maths exam, we see it with the ex exponential models. We see it all the time. Exactly. Thank you very much, Rene. Thank you very much, Lucy. T is equal to zero. Initially, is at the start. So time is zero. Yeah? T is equal to zero. Now, it says initially it was full of water. Okay. Well, think about it. Our differential equation is with respect to h and t, the variables h and t. So the other, the only other value would be a value for h for my other initial condition, yeah? Now, it says it was initially full of water. What does that imply? Let's look at our diagram again. If it's initially full of water, what does that imply about h? What do we think? Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much, Alex. Rene, exactly, yeah. It says, given initially that the, the cone was full of water. Well, what, what was it when it was full of water? The height was four, right? So therefore, the other value for H or the other value for the initial condition, I should say, is H equals four, yeah? So just be aware of that, right? That even though you're doing differential equations, sometimes they like to be nice and they'll give it to you T equals zero, H equals four, but they want to test you. They want to see, do you really understand what's going on here? So they give you some sort of sentence and you need to extract out the initial conditions from there, yeah? So let's do this. This is easy, though, because we've got this here. Now, let's see. We've got, uh, we've got, let's write again. We've got h to the 3 over 2 dh by dt, right, is equal to minus 1 over 200. Now, we separate variables. So these here are fine, right? The only problem here is this dt, right? The h's are fine. I need to move the dt. So I'm going to just do h to the 3 over 2 dh, right? is equal to minus one over 200 dt, yeah? And now what do we do? We just put integral signs like this, yeah? So now this is just, this is the standard integration. 
uh, we add one to the power and we divide by the new power. So it's going to be H. 3 over 2 plus 1 is 5 over 2. If I divide by 5 over 2, that is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So I'm going to rub that out and I'm going to put 2 fifths instead. Like that. I'm going to put 2 fifths here. Right? And then this is equal to, now remember, minus 1 over 200 is a constant. So when I integrate a constant, you just get the constant times the variable they're integrating with. So it's going to be minus 1 over 200, right? T. Minus 1 over 200, T. And then plus our constant of integration. Yeah? Does that make sense, guys? Okay. I think somebody needs to go. No worries. No worries. I hope you found it beneficial. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upload this to my YouTube anyway, so you'll be able to watch it after. But thanks for your message. Somebody just dropped me a message. But yeah. Uh, is this all clear? Yeah, good. Now we've got, remember, initially T was zero, H is four. So now we're just going to plug these in. Yeah? Yeah. Minus one over 200 is a constant, right? Think about it. If you put that into your calculator, you're going to get a number out. Remember, it's like this. If I do 4T, so if I just do 4DT, right, it's just going to give me 4T. If I have a constant K, DT, it's just going to be KT. Yeah? Minus 1 over 200 is a number. So it's just minus 1 over 200T. Does that make sense? Yep. And then now, just finishing up, just finishing up, uh, we're going to plug in our values. So we're going to get 2 fifths, and then it's going to be uh, 4 to the power of 5 over 2, and then T is 0, so it's just C. So this here will give me C. I'll put this in my calculator and see what it gives me. So it's going to be uh, 2 fifths, 2 fifths, uh, uh, times by four to the power of uh, five over two. Hopefully this gives me um, an exact value. It does 64 over five, yeah? So C is 64 over five. So our complete model, our complete model, right? Is gonna be, where was it? It was uh, here, yeah? It's just gonna be this. That minus, sorry, not minus, two fifths H to the five over two is equal to minus one over 200 t plus our constant of integration 64 over 5. does that make sense guys we all okay with that yeah i'm just gonna wait for anybody to say yes or no just so i know we can continue yeah good stuff all right now we've got one more part we've got one more part now it says it says here for part c it takes 43 minutes for the container to empty use this information to comment on the suitability of this model yeah so I'm going to put this here. Now, whenever I'm doing these questions, right, let me visualize it. So I'm going to get my diagram again as well, yeah, just to see what's happening here. Let me just make this, let me zoom in a bit. Oh, no, I've got it here. Perfect. Yeah. So got this here. Okay. It takes close to 43 minutes for the container to empty, right? Use this information to, con to comment on the suitability of this model. So it takes 43 minutes for the container to empty. And we need to comment on the suitability of this model in light of this information here, yeah? So this is our model, yeah? This is our model. And apparently 43 minutes after the water starts leaking, it's gone, yeah? There's no more water left. Now we need to figure out the suitability of this model based on this information. Does anybody have any suggestions as to how we go about doing this? Cont 43 minutes for the container to empty. What does that imply about our model? Remember, our model is only in H and T, right? Right, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. Thank you very much, guys. Remember, remember, we don't, I've seen rearranged to make H the subject. You can, you don't have to though, because you can always just plug in values and you can do it after. But remember, if the container is empty, that implies that the height has gone to zero if there's no more water left, right? So what should we, what, what, what we should expect from our model is that when we plug in T equals some number, it's not 43 though, because you've got to be careful. Remember, if you look at the question again, remember T was in, where was it? T was in seconds, it said. Where was T in seconds? It was somewhere. I can't find it. Yeah, T seconds, yeah? So we can't plug in T equals 43 because T is in seconds, not in minutes. So we need to just do 43 times 60 to convert into seconds, right? So what you want to do is plug in that value and you should get something 
very close to zero. Yeah. So when we plug that in, let's see what we get. Yeah. So uh, let's do this here. We're going to do what? Well, let me just put this here actually. Comp container to empty, this implies that H is equal to zero. So you're just going to say plug in T is equal to 43 times 60 to convert it to seconds and see what you get. Yeah. What you get. What you get. Okay. Now, let me plug this in. So I'm going to get two fifths of H, five over two to five over two is equal to minus one over two hundred. And then uh, if I put this into my calculator, let me get my calculator up. It's going to be uh, 43 times 60, isn't it? 43 times 60. This is equal to 2,580 seconds. Yeah. 2,580 seconds. Yeah. Now, 2,580 seconds plus 64 over 5. Yeah. Now, we've got this here. We just need to figure out uh, what uh, H is. Yeah. Now, let's do this here. Let's tidy up the right-hand side. Let me just move this here so you can see everything. So we've got this here. We've got a minus 1 over 200. Minus 1 over 200. Multiplied by 2580. 2580. And then plus 64 over 5. This gives us minus 1 over 10. Yeah. So I've got 2 fifths H. 5 over 2 is equal to minus 1 over 10. And then we're just going to figure out what H is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I've got a question here. And some people have to go. No worries. No worries. Good luck for Tuesday. Why don't you substitute H equals 0 first? Uh, due to the fact that they've given us this piece of information i mean technically technically you could do that because it still means the same thing so you could you could make hate zero first and then figure out what t is and see if it gets you to 2580 but the way the question is set up is it tells us the time so i will just put in t yeah but technically speaking it does mean the same thing either way so does somebody just ask why did i why did i plug in t equals 2580 as opposed to rearranging from h equals zero to get t just due to the fact that the statement is saying T, yeah? It's giving us in terms of T, that's why. Hope that makes sense. But yeah, uh, finishing off, we're going to get uh, we're gonna get uh, times by five divided by two. So I'm going to say H to the five over two is equal to minus one over 10. I'm going to times by five. I'm going to divide by two to get H. And then obviously, let me just do that here quickly, just to tidy up a bit more. Minus one over 10 times by five and then divide by two. This gives me this here, minus a quarter. H to the five over two is equal to minus a quarter, right? Now, how do I get H now? Remember, this just means uh, the square root of H, right? All to the power of five, yeah? So to do this now, right? I'm going to take the fifth root and then square it on, yeah? So H will equal to the fifth root, the fifth root of minus a quarter, right? And then I'm going to square it. And then this, we should hope to give it something very close to zero. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to just do the fifth root, fifth root of answer. And I'm going to square it, square it, and then uh, see what it gives me. Get this here, 0 0.574, right? What do we think about that, guys? 0 0.5743, blah, blah, blah. Is that okay? What do we think? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Thank you very much, Alex. So yeah, remember, the model, this cone is only four meters high. It's not 4,000 meters, right? It's not 400,000 meters, it's only four meters high. So we're pretty much only an eighth away from the bottom. That's quite, that's quite large relatively, yeah? We could say from here, this here, we could just say this here is not really close to zero. Not close to zero in relation to the height, yeah? So it's not a suitable model to the height, yeah? So not suitable. Does that make sense, guys? Is that all clear? Just want to make sure we're all okay with this just before we round up. So I wanted to get through more questions today, but I didn't realize, because this is probably in my first class doing an A-level group, and you know these questions are so long and difficult. So we only did it, we only did about three. But is this clear? This uh, is this okay? Anybody have any questions just before uh, we round up? Make sure we're all okay with that. 
Okay, just see. Cool, cool. So I'll just see the last part. Uh, I've got a message about the last part. Let me see. Okay, so basically, when I said the relation to the height, right, is for example, for example, uh, the height the height of the cone is only four meters, right? So for example, let's say I had a cone like this, right? And it was only one meter high, yeah? And then they told me, so this the height is one meter. This is an example, right? The height is one meter. And then they say, well, after 43, after 43 minutes, the, the water is gone. There's no more water. What I expect is that H will be close to zero, but we've got H is equal to 0 0.5. So imagine, imagine here, right? I have a water, I have a clone here, and then after 43 minutes, it's at 0 0.5, yeah? This is only half of that cone. This is in relation to the height, it's not very close to zero. And it's the same thing for four, right? Four is only four times one. If it was maybe 400 or 4,000 or 40,000, then it would make, it would be okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, why isn't it close to zero? Sorry, also the height is the height, is the whole thing, whole thing squared. It is, I mean, it, relatively, it's not close to, I mean, it is close to zero because 0 0.5 is close to zero, but in in respect of this actual model that we have here, right? 0 0.5 in relation to one meter, right? 0 0.5 is close to zero, but the whole thing is one meter higher. So in relation to it, it's not really a good model because we've still got halfway to go for the water to fill, for the water to uh, leave the tank or the cone, whatever it is. So it's the same thing for the four meters. Is, is that clear? Just wanna make sure we're all okay with that before. Okay, cool, 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 cool. So yeah, uh, yeah, we'll leave it there. What I'll say is uh, good luck, good luck for Tuesday. Just make sure before you do the exam, just make sure you just go over your questions, do loads of past papers, go over your specification as well. And uh, yeah, you guys should be fine. I'm, not, I'm sure you guys have been studying hard anyway. But yeah, good luck again. And yeah, we'll leave it there. Take care, guys.